Okay, welcome everybody to the September 9th uh, working group meeting, multi-scale modeling and viral pandemics. Uh, we have two talks today, one from the Air Force Research Office uh, and the other one from uh, the Institute of uh, Fundamental Technological Research in Poland. So a nice diverse audience uh, and topics. Uh, we have uh, both of our speakers have agreed to stay for a conversation if there are questions after their presentations. And as usual, I need to remind you that the meeting is being live streamed and recorded. So you know the drill. Uh, Reinhardt and I are always available for suggestions. We'd very much appreciate your ideas for future speakers. Uh, we're always looking for interesting people especially if you have suggestions that are a little bit out of the box. If you have people doing interesting experimental work, interesting clinical work, measuring animals, uh, looking at drug mobility, any of these things, uh, industrial, uh, pharmaceutical suggestions, we'd be very grateful for the connections. Uh, Jim Sluka and Bruce are always available as well uh, to help out on anything you need. Uh, we have our usual communication channels. Uh, we now have also uh, a uh, Facebook page uh, as well as the LinkedIn page. Uh, we have our YouTube channel, Twitter, Slack, and so on. Please help us get the word out about these seminars and about things going on in the working group. Are there any announcements this week? Anything funding? meetings, uh, new publications, uh, hiring opportunities, anything that anyone would like to announce for this week. I guess I could say that I'm in the market for a postdoc who's doing multi-scale, multicellular modeling. So if you have a good uh, recent PhD student or postdoc looking for a second opportunity, uh, I have a position not in, in uh, viral infection and immune response, but in developmental biology. But if you have anyone who is uh, interested in a postdoc in the area of uh, multicellular modeling, please send them my way. Any other announcements? Okay. Well, in that case, uh, our schedule for upcoming meetings and mini seminars uh, we have uh, Daniel Becker and John Burke uh, next week. Uh, so that'll be an interesting pair of speakers. Then uh, September 23rd, we have Russ Taylor and Jorge Velasco Hernandez uh, speaking uh, September 30th, uh, Kai Ming Yi. And uh, we have some good speakers lined up beyond that, but we also have some empty slots. So please help us fill the roster. Uh, if you have students who would like to speak, postdocs who'd like to speak, you'd like to speak, or there are people you'd love to hear, please do let us know. Uh, please remember to mute your mic when you're not uh, speaking. As usual, we'll save the, since both of our speakers agreed to do the discussion afterwards, please save uh, questions till both of the talks are finished. And I'll give a five minute warning to our speakers if it looks like they may be running over a little bit. And with that, I don't want to do, uh, take any more of our speakers time. You know that I don't do elaborate introductions. Our first speaker uh, is Virginia uh, Pesur from the ARO Biomath Program. Uh, we've had the fortune of having uh, representatives a lot of uh, mathematical biology funding programs speak to us. And I will turn it over to her. The Army Research Office is something that a lot of, I didn't, it's located about 20 minutes from where I grew up and I didn't know anything about it until um, I saw the job advertisement for being a program manager. So a lot of, a lot of people don't know much about it. Reinhardt is, is as much of an expert um, as anybody. Um, so he's a good person to ask if you have, um, what, have questions about what it's like to work with them research office or about some of the um, opportunities we offer. So the most, the most important things, I guess, to, to start off with are that we're all about um, basic science. The idea is to get the, um, to find, to idealize, find, and fund, and transition the best basic high-risk, high-reward research worldwide. 
So there are two things about that that are often um, surprising to people. One is that we um, do as basic research as as certainly as NSF as any other um, funding organization that I know of. And the other is that we are looking for international researchers as well as um, U.S. And of course, that's because a lot of great research is not done here. If we're trying to find the best research, we have to go outside of the U.S. And we actually have people in South America and um, England, or I guess London, mainly London and Tokyo, that are trying to help us find other people to work with um, outside of the U.S. So that's a really good opportunity for um, people from other um, other countries to work with uh, American researchers. Um, let's see. So I guess um, in terms of what we're trying to do, so it's all basic science. Some of it is uh, things that we know that some of the Army or other military researchers um, need or are going to be needing very soon. Some of it is just uh, things that we think are going to be needed, you know, it, it says they're 20, 30, 40 years in the future. So we're very um, forward looking at the same time that we have to kind of balance that with needing to be able to show uh, the military higher ups that we're doing things that are of use right now. I think you can go on to the next slide. So um, I will again apologize for some of these, some of these slides. Some of them are really <laughs> a lot on them. Um, I just included this one. There's about 50 slides that were part of this deck, and I've, I've chosen, I think, eight of them. Um, I chose this one because it's talking about um, building the future that's kind of the, the forward-looking 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the future um, idea. And then the second um, item there is solving existing problems. So that's kind of the, you know, the um, what do the people at the Army Research Lab or at other, uh, other applied um, military uh, science organizations, uh, research organizations, what do they need now? Um, we also are concerned with trying to transition the research. That's number three there. Um, we do, we are interested in getting um, younger people who are, um, may not even realize that they're interested in science um, and also, as well as, you know, um, uh, undergrads and grad students and postdocs interested in working um, on on army related problems and with army um, with army researchers or in army labs um, and of course the point is to um, prepare uh, for the technological superiority of U.S. Um, armed forces and they're calling this now you can see over there on the right um, transformational overmatch is kind of the the buzz buzz phrase uh, these days uh, you can look at the next slide. So this is, um, just wanted to show you a little bit, you can kind of concentrate on the bottom half of the slide. I just kind of wanted to show you how the Army Research Office is organized. So uh, we have three different uh, technological divisions. The first is physical sciences, then we have engineering sciences and information sciences. Physical sciences essentially includes um, chemistry, physics, and biology. And then engineering includes electronics, materials, and mechanical, um, mechanical engineering. And information sciences includes um, com you know, computing, network sciences, and math um, in terms of their, their uh, scientific um, branches. So each of these branches, like chemistry is a branch, each of those branches uh, typically has four different programs. So my program is within the mathematical sciences branch under the information sciences division. And within that mathematical sciences branch, we did have um, we had biomass, we had computational math, probability and statistics, and then there was a program that was called modeling of complex systems, which lately had been topological and geometrical um, modeling. So uh, that program is being uh, handed over to a new person um, come October, and I'm not quite sure what that's going to look like. And then the probability and statistics program was recently uh, basically disbanded. There's going to be no more um, funds for our regular single investigator uh, projects, which is a real shame, but it's the way it is, um, just so you know. Uh, and then um, there are a number of other programs you might be interested in besides the math programs. There's some, um, there's a social sciences program within the network sciences branch. 
um, some of the computing sciences might be of interest in terms of um, machine learning or AI uh, kinds of, of topics. Within the life sciences branch, there is neuroscience, molecular genetics, uh, biochemistry, and uh, microbiology. And there's also, there was a, another social science program. That one was one which um, Lisa Troyer, you see her as the head of the physical sciences division. That, she was heading that one up. She's a mathematical sociologist, but now she's taken over the, the helm of the whole division. And that program is also, um, I think, basically going away. So a um, few other things that might be of interest. There's um, in mechanical sciences, there's a, um, a fluid mechanics program. Um, any of those, I, I, I told Reinhardt I wanted to show you all of these just to kind of see, just so you can kind of see how it was organized, because there may be um, maybe programs of interest in any of these uh, branches, really. It just depends on, um, on what your specific interests are. So um, I guess at this point, I could say a little bit about my program in particular. All of our programs have uh, different thrust areas, and those can change um, at any time. Mine have remained, except for one, have remained relatively constant. One of my, my most important, what I would say, is fundamental laws of biology, right? So you're trying to, to look at um, ideas like heterogeneity, biological time clocks, robustness and resilience, symmetry, some, some of these ideas that are um, for ones that could run across uh, various different biological systems and at different temporal and spatial scales. And of course, the idea is to come up with um, sort of a um, laws of biology, like we have laws of physics. And to me, that was about the most basic high risk, high reward idea in biomathematics, which did start with, um, with me coming to Aero. So it hasn't been around for, for very long. Um, and really, I feel like really just getting started trying to look at uh, those fundamental laws. The second um, thrust there in my program is multi-scale modeling and inverse problems, and that's that's one that uh, I've been working with as part of um, part of IMAG. And then the third one is kind of a new one. I did have transit dynamics, and that was one. And of course, my example of transit dynamics was always uh, epidemics. You know, of course, long before COVID, and um, no one really seems to be taking me up on that. So I I um, I switched to um, hybrid modeling. So the idea was instead of, you know, trying to figure out whether you wanted to do whether whether a problem would be better approached using statistical modeling or mechanistic mathematical modeling, as in um, as the biomath program is basically concerned with, um, the idea is to be able to use um, all of the data or take best, optimize our use of the existing data at the same time that we're still interested in understanding the mechanism, biological mechanism. Um, so those are kind of the three main areas of interest in my program, I've kept them. You know, you can see they're they're fairly they're fairly broad. Lots of different things will fit inside them, and a lot of uh, a lot of ideas, people's ideas, will fit more than one of those um, those thrust areas. And uh, you know, if anything comes along that really can't fit in one of those areas, but it's just amazing, we're you know still fund it. We don't it doesn't have to um, doesn't have to fit in one of those areas. It'll have to, for purposes of of um, record keeping, we have to say it fits in one of these categories, but it really is, is research that's um, really stretching the bounds of mechanistic mathematical modeling um, and giving us some sort of um, either, either coming up with um, new, really uh, transformational new knowledge about biology um, and mathematics, then that's something that we did, I would still consider funding. So I can answer, certainly answer questions at the end of this after, uh, about my own program, um, but also can direct you hopefully towards other programs that might be of interest if um, if you think there are um, there's some interest interest there. And I guess if you do the next the next slide, that might be talk about the um, no, not yet. Okay. So there are a number of different kinds of funding mechanisms that we use. So this the single investigator program was kind of what I was is kind of our bread and butter. That's what I was um, uh, had mentioned earlier. So that's typically just one investigator, although for me, oftentimes it's more than one because I'll get someone in math and someone in, in biology. And for me, that's it's typically, I try to cap it at 120K per year. They're usually three years, uh, three years long. Um, the URI program involves the MURI, the Multidisciplinary University Research Initiative Program, which I'm glad to talk about more if people are not familiar with it, as well as the DURIT program, which provides instrumentation, whether you are currently funded or not. 
um, by, our, by one of our grants, and then PKs for the early career scientists. And there's also the um, SBIR and STTR small business programs, which you are probably familiar with. Um, there are quite a few different organizations that um, offer these. They're all a little bit different. And that's also something that I would be interested if anyone has any ideas for um, commercializable products that you think would be relevant to your interest, um, you can talk to me about that. Um, we have the University Affiliated Research Centers in a couple of different areas. That's probably not as relevant to most of you. Um, the HBCUMI program, the Historically Black Colleges and Universities, and Minority Serving Institutions, we've got, I think, more and more um, of an emphasis on, on funding. Uh, funding these institutions, and then there's also another um, another program that funds HBCUs and MIs called called REP. I actually, I'm not even sure what that stands for, but um, those are those are some of our our um, some of our main types of funding mechanisms. We also take part in the DEP score. Um, DEP score is is uh, DEP score states are I think it, I think it's 33 or 34 states are DEP score states. And this year, um, if you want to look that up, you can see on the map which, which states are depth score states. There, there are states that don't get as much federal money, federal funding. And um, my program is one this year that you can apply um, to get funding through depth score for. And the end of, I guess it's the 27th of September, white papers are due for that. It's a, it's a max of 200K a year for three years. And if you're interested in that, please contact me directly. Let's move on to the next one. I want—I know I took a lot of space at the beginning. So, I want, so here is, is how you can find out more about our programs. The um, broad, agency, broad agency announcement um, for uh, for ARO. So I'm not sure why it says ARL slash ARA. You want the ARO BAA. And it has all of our different programs. It has all of our thrust areas along with our contact information. Um, so I wanted to put that up there just so you would um, you would know where to go to get the information. Next slide, please. So um, I wanted to put some some things, um, this slide up here, because I thought it was good in terms of some of the things that we that we consider important, um, right? So we're trying to get at basic research. Uh, we're trying to do things that are that are risky. They're hard. We don't know if the research is going to to pan out or not, but ARO is a good place to come for things that you're excited about, but you're not sure uh, whether they might, whether they're going to work out or not. We're kind of the opposite of DARPA in that respect. We will, we're not going to, um, <laughs> to stop funding research in the first year because it, it hasn't produced anything yet. And actually, our, our the director, when I first got to ARO, said, you know, if all of your research projects uh, work out, then you are not funding um, very risky research. So that is what we are looking for. Um, you can also say why are you, you know, why why is now the time to be doing this research and why are you the person to be doing it? Why is it important? Um, so again, talking about being hard, where's the risk? And then what resources will it take? Next slide, please. So I just this is definitely one that I figured if you wanted to look at it afterwards, it would be it might not be a, a bad idea. So it just kind of talks about um, this is kind of kind of talks about the the way that at least I typically engage with potential PIs. So we so I either get uh, phone calls or emails about some um, a basic idea, then I ask for a white paper, and I do not use the white paper form that's um, in the BAA. I ask for two pages, no more than two pages. I have five questions I ask. The questions are, what's the problem you're trying to address? What's the approach you're planning to use? How's the approach unique? How will the research potentially benefit the field? And in my case, that's um, that's the modeling as well as biology. And then how might it at some point in the future benefit DOD? And then um, typically have a discussion um, at the white paper stage. And then if it seems like it's a go, then um, ask you to write a proposal. And that's uh, done using grants.gov. And we try not to get people to ask you to write proposals if we don't think there's a good chance of it, if it reviews well. That we'd have, that we would, and, and also that we, of course, that we have funding for it, that we would want to fund it. We don't want to waste people's time, so we we hope to to use the white paper to um, to prevent that. And um, at the proposal stage for a three-year uh, proposal, we would typically get um, asked for four reviewers, three of whom were 
outside of government and one um, one army reviewer. And I often try to get people from overseas just to let them know that we have what we do, what our proposals are like, and that we do um, try to engage with um, international scientists. Next slide, please. So this is just the last the last slide. I just wanted to give a little bit of a of an idea of um, the fact that we have lots of other programs that people might be interested in. I don't take part in, I don't have a lot to do with, um, with many of these. I know about the undergraduate research apprenticeship program and the high school apprenticeship program, um, especially the high school apprenticeship program is pretty neat because it, it does, it can really change um, someone's traje trajectory if they end up working with, um, with scientists that we are funding um, at that stage. Um, so there's lots of there's opportunities for people from, you know, high school, maybe even before that. Um, oh yeah, there's K through 12 local outreach programs. So basically from, from kindergarten through, you know, um, through postdoc and beyond, there are opportunities if you're interested in working with, um, with Army Research Lab or the Army and um, more generally. And if there's anything that, you know, that you would like more information on, um, please let me know. I may very well not know much about it myself, but I can direct you to, to support someone that would, um, that would be able to give you more information. Um, so I'm sure there's things I've missed here that you would like to know about. I will wait since, I, since it took so long to get started. I'll wait till the end and let you ask me, um, ask me questions then. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of... In the interest of, of time, I think we should probably, hold on a second. Boy, today is a bad Zoom day. My Zoom client has crashed. Um, We see and hear you. Okay. It's not letting me. Did the screen share work? Yes, it works. What, what are you seeing? Seeing September 9th, the first screen. All right. Well, I just have to do it this way. Um, so we next have Tomas Lipniaczki uh, from the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research in Poland, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, super spreader events. And uh, I will turn it over to him, I hope. Yeah, so I may try share share my screen, right? Right. I may have to actually log out of uh, Zoom and log back in because it looks like I can't. Now let's see if Tomas can share. Yeah, I hope so. So. Uh, yeah, can you can you see, can see it? Now? Hello, can you can yeah, you see yes, my we, screen? We can see your screen. Okay, good. And you see it as a slideshow or as a presentation. As a presentation. Let's get here. Okay. Yeah, but if it is well visible, maybe I will stay with this. I let me check and and now it is presentation. Um, we're we're seeing the screen that we should be seeing, I believe. Yes, it looks good. Yeah. It looks okay, right? Okay, so 
So uh, thank you very much for the invitation and I will uh, start. So uh, I am going to tell you about the calculation of reproduction number of SARS-CoV and the role of sub super spreaders in uh, influencing this uh, reproduction number. Uh, so uh, you may uh, naturally ask what, what is the reason of calculation of uh, basic reproduction number now or calculation it a uh, year ago when uh, the epidemic was already advanced. So from my from the current perspective, it is just to avoid the pit fails that can be taken uh, that that can arise in the in the in the next um, uh, epidemic outbreak of the of the other of the other disease and also even from uh, current perspective the basic reproduction number still dictates uh, uh, what should be the immune proportion that is required to achieve herd immunity. Yeah, so we know from, from this uh, simple equation that if the reproduction number is high, then the immune uh, proportion is also high. So if, for example, the reproduction number is 10, then the immune proportion is uh, 90%, so it is extremely hard to reach. So basically, you have vaccinate everybody or or, or let the disease spread to, to, infect, uh, to infect everybody. So, um, okay, so the, uh, our estimates based on the spread of pandemic in uh, several European countries, as well as New York, is in the range between say five and 11, I will show you how we calculated it, why the early WHO estimate was around, around two. So the difference is huge. And I think that, that this, uh, in, 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 in my opinion, too much uh, low uh, reproduction number estimate uh, done by WHO was a reason of say some neglectment of, of uh, 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 epidemic epidemic measures that, that were not taken but should be taken uh, 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 at the beginning of the of the outbreak. So uh, uh, we have been using the Sayer model and I, would like to turn your attention on the on the aspects of the Sayer model that turns out to be important when you estimate the basic reproduction number. So typically, when you think about the Sayer model, you have four states. You have susceptible state, you have so-called exposed state in which individuals were exposed to infection, and in fact, they are infected but they are not yet infectious. And then from this exposed state, the individual, uh, after latent period, the individual becomes infectious and may infect the susceptible individuals. And after uh, say a couple of days, the infectious individual is removed. It Basically, it means that it is no longer infectious. It doesn't mean that it is recovered because uh, the, as, as we know now, the infectious period is relatively short. The effective infectious period is relatively short just because the individual can be isolated. It relies that, that he or she is infected and it can be isolated or he, he just is not infecting anymore, but, but the, 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 the main way how, how the individual stop to be infectious is just by isolation. Okay, and now 
when you take the single exposed state, then the time in which you are uh, as an exposed individual will be exponentially distributed. While when you take a number of exposed states, then the time in, in which you spend in the exposed state will be Erlang distributed if, if these steps are, are exponential. And it is really very important because if you have a, a large number of steps, this Erlang distribution is relatively very narrow. So basically it means that you spend like five days uh, in, the, in the latent period and then you became infectious. And if you have a smaller number of exposed steps, this, this distribution is broader. So there is like leaking. If you imagine that you have only one exposed state and the distribution is exponential, you can basically become infected next day with relatively high probability, okay? And now there is infectious period. We may have, uh, based on constraints that come from literature, we may uh, uh, think that infectious period, um, that uh, infectious uh, are in, in, in one step or in two steps. It is hard to say which, which, which model is better. So maybe the model with two infectious step is better Basically, it means that it is very unlikely that you will be infectious for a, a very short time. So, so if there are two steps, it means that the probability in, in zero is zero, but the first derivative is positive, yeah? If you have like six steps, basically it means that first five derivatives uh, of the latent period distribution in zero are zero. Okay, so uh, uh, having having this uh, this model with uh, number of uh, uh, exposed states and number of infectious states, you can you can write equations, ordinary differential equations, assuming that the population in a given country or city is well mixed. There is nothing special in in this equation. Something that it is to be discussed is this number of, of, of steps and, and distribution. And now the way we, we took is to estimate the basic reproduction number from the doubling time. So uh, uh, this is the formula we derived it, but after we derived it, we realized that it was done 15 years before us. And, and published. So here the reproduction number is a quite complicated function of doubling time, the time in which the number of infected individuals doubles of uh, sigma. This is this uh, rate in which you uh, pass, sorry, from uh, one exposed state to the, to the other exposed state. Uh, uh, and uh, the um, and and gamma, this is the rate in which you are uh, leaving the infectious state. So, and here are the the numbers of uh, uh, exposed and infectious states. Okay. So, so you can see that it depends on, on, on these numbers. So we estimated the doubling time based on the, on the uh, published data for, as I said, several countries, China, Italy, France, Germany, Spain, UK, Switzerland, and New York State. Putting all US together make no sense as the Initially, the outbreak was in the in the New York State. So when we put a uh, whole US, we will be merging the 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 states with very different with very uh, different dynamics. And based on this, we 
estimated in these uh, uh, countries and in New York, the doubling time. So you can see that the doubling time is between say two and three. Okay, and this is doubling time calculated on reported cases. Of course, we perfectly know that there was underestimation of reported cases, but if the underestimation was like that only 10% of cases was reported through first two weeks, it is, it is not the problem because we are interested how this number is growing in the log scale. So if the underestimation is a given by a given factor, it is, it is not important. Okay, and then, which is quite surprising, at least it was surprising for us, you can estimate reproduction number based on reported deaths. So, of course, death reporting was much more solid than uh, of new cases, and we got very similar numbers between two and three. So, seems that this method that we plot uh, uh, reported cases in, in log scales, take the exponential phase of about two weeks and estimate doubling times, it, it is res resonable. I, at least I get convinced comparing these doubling times based on reported cases and, and reported uh, deaths. Okay, and now, so this Vertical lines are, are the lines corresponding to doubling times based on reported deaths or reported cases. And here are the model trajectories. We considered four model variants. So two firsts are our, that we have uh, six uh, exposed states to get a proper distribution of latent time, which is relatively narrow and we have uh, one or two infectious infectious states and uh, two lines on the bottom are the lines corresponding to early models in which there were either two uh, exposed states or one exposed state so you can see that the that the very early study by by uh, by Wu published in Lancet, they use only one exposed state. And when you use a smaller number of exposed states, the same doubling time corresponds to smaller reproduction number, just because of this leaking that it is possible that, that you infect very fast. Okay, but this difference is, okay, this is when we take the, say the doubling time, between two and three, the difference it can be between five and seven. So it is not huge difference. So the main source of uh, difference, or this is just comparison with, with early reports. The main source of difference is in estimation of doubling time. So uh, our doubling time, estimation was between two and three days and in early estimates this doubling time was much longer so what can what can be the reason the reason was that in early estimates the the researchers they they focus on early chain of epidemic transmissions that were very well documented but in this early chain of epidemic transmissions, there were no super spreaders, just by chance in a sense. So when we take the model in which there are super spreaders, here we call them even hyper spreaders that, that uh, say uh, uh, for hyper spreaders, we assume that uh, there is only 1% of hyperspreaders, just to exaggerate maybe to, a little bit, that there is only 1% of hyperspreaders, but they are responsible for two thirds of infections. 
So how looks the cumulative number of confirmed cases? When you start from normal spreader, it spreads at relatively low rate, but at some points, first hyper spreader appears and it affects a large number of people. So, uh, and then this a hyper spreaders appears like on, on daily basis. So you change the exponent. There is a slow growth due to a chain of infections. It can even extinct, yeah? Because if we assume that normal spreader infects say two or three people, it can happen that it will infect nobody. And now we know that the epidemic uh, like invaded several countries, including US and extinct, yeah? So, and then when this uh, super spreaders appears, there is a different exponent. So when you estimate the reproduction number on this first early chain of reactions, you will get a, a smaller growth, longer, uh, doubling time, and as a consequence, uh, substantially smaller reproduction number. So uh, here you can you can simulate stochastic trajectories trajectories and see what you will deduce. What will be the uh, distribution of of your estimate? So in the case when there is a small number of hyper spreaders, you can see that the distribution is, uh, is very broad. And when you based your estimate based on 30 days since the first case, as, as it was done in, in the early studies, you will get much broader distribution and you will get much longer doubling time. While when you base your estimates uh, uh, taking the growth for 14 days since the time in which you had first 100 cases, the noise will be smaller. So you will get a more narrow distribution and much smaller doubling time. So we think that 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 this is that this is the point why the estimation based on early chain of reactions in China uh, led researchers to too long doubling time, and we can repeat it, uh, repeat this like calculating doubling time using our method. 14 days since 100 cases or 30 days since first case for different uh, countries and regions. And you can see that basically when you use this first method, but you consider the growth is super spreaders, you may get ridiculously long doubling times like uh, 12 days for German. It really depends on the, on the on the dynamic in, in different countries, which will be very noisy because when you start from the first case, it can be really very slow, uh, slow growth initially. So it may happen that you will get even shorter doubling times, but statistically you are getting longer doubling times. But what is crucial is that these doubling time estimates is very noisy. It, strongly depends on the on the initial initial trajectory so the take home message from from uh, from this part I, I want to show you three slides more is that when you are estimating reproduction number based on the very beginning of the outbreak taking a single trajectory you will very likely, underestimate its value and it will be not very reliable. So, so it, it will very strongly depends on the, on the first trajectory. 
and uh, okay, so so it it was uh, published in Royal Society of Open Science. It got quite quite broad attention, so we get happy about this. And now I want to show you just three slides. So uh, I'm pretty sure that you have heard about, now it is called alpha variant. It was called uh, variant of concern in England. And here is how uh, this variant was spreading. So, so this is black is, is the other strands. This is the variant which uh, had characteristic substitution at, at residue 222, and it was like winning in UK, in England. But then it was outcompeted by, by this English, English, English variant or variant on Corsair or alpha variant. And we have calculated what is the, the advantage of this variant just uh, in exponential scale, comparing the ratio of uh, uh, variant that was dominating with this new variant. And we found that this new variant had twice higher reproduction number. So, so now when you think that, that the new variants are emerging and if they are advantageous, Basically, it, it implies at least at, at the first two years of pandemic that they have higher repro reproduction number. So this reproduction number is uh, increasing due to advantageous mutations. At some point, when you have a high number of uh, vaccinated or infected uh, individuals, the advantageous mutations are those that uh, allow to infect vaccinations or recovered individuals. So they do not need to have a higher replication or re reproduction number, but if they are able to infect recovered individuals, they can spread uh, faster than, than existing existing Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you very much for listening if you are still here. Okay, thank you very much. The timing was perfect. Uh, I appreciate that. So I have prepared breakout rooms. And so depending on how the discussion goes, people can move to the breakout rooms, or we can have a general discussion. Thank you for both our speakers. Um, and it's time to ask some questions uh, to our speakers today. I appreciate everyone's patience with the technical snafu. I, mean, I, I could start with a, a quick question. I'm from the series, maybe I'll start with the second presentation. So very interesting, um, I guess, not having a math background can I ask you how you can control for an increase in the availability of diagnostic tests over time um, for, for these estimates? So one could assume that maybe early in the pandemic testing wasn't at the level that it should have been. So you're going to have, you know, the 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 bolt the target's going to be a little off. And so, um, are, how, can you control for that in your equations? So if I properly got your question. Uh, 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 you are asking uh, about the effect that when uh, during pandemic you are testing better and better, you are catching more cases. Yeah, more the Correct. higher percentage of, of cases. Yeah, this is true. So, so uh, uh, the ratio of the true cases to the uh, found cases will not be constant. However, in our estimates, we took only two weeks. So I think that in this two week period, this effect was relatively small. And I think that this assumption is confirmed 
by the uh, recording of uh, deaths, which uh, deaths should be proportional to new cases. Of course, there will be delay, but we found that the deaths were increasing basically with the same doubling time between two and three days. And the recording of deaths was much better than recording of new cases when you take the, say, reasonable countries, you can see that the excess of deaths uh, matches relatively well with the number of recorded COVID deaths. I mean, not in all countries, it really depends. I mean, uh, for example, initially in Poland, the difference was uh, quite big, but in countries like uh, France or especially Belgium, the match was really perfect. So, so the excess of deaths over the over the 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 average uh, average line, including season, was matching perfectly with the with the number of uh, COVID assigned deaths. So we think that 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 using deaths is is uh as uh, more re reliable but anyway we got we got the same dynamic of course Thanks. now of course now uh, there is no proportionality between the uh, between the the registered cases and deaths due to vaccinations yeah so the death rate now fortunately in countries like uk is much lower than than it was a year ago. Makes sense. Thanks. Great. Other questions for either of our speakers? So. Uh, They don't like to be the one to ask the questions if they're. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if. I don't know if Virginia's, or I, I don't know if the first speaker's still on. But I, I think she is. Yes. Oh, okay. So I, I guess I'll I'm not on the phone. Okay. Can you? I, 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 I have, I'd have to get back on the phone. I couldn't listen to the the um, the second speaker and stay on the phone. So. Gotcha. And I don't have. Uh, I can't find the. Um, if you can hear me here, that's great. Yeah, I can, can hear you great. Um, my name is Reed. I'm at NIAD, and so I, I enjoyed your presentation. I, I guess I had a couple yeah. questions, and they, they slipped away, um, but I'm going to ask the one that's on the top of my mind right now. So you talked about the funding opportunities and, and sort of the money associated with it. Are, were those, are those total costs, or does that, is that uh, like both direct costs and indirect costs, or is that that's total. Uh, total costs? That's okay. total. Okay. Yeah, that's what we have. That's what we've got. <laughs> gotcha. No, that's so, fine. Yeah. Just... It's supposed to be so. So, so the normal, you know, the normal amount is is supposed to cover, you know, grad student or postdoc, month or two of summer support for the PI, a little bit of supplies, a little bit of travel. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. And so, kind of. Jumping off of that, so for the projects or proposals, it's just kind of an open call, or is there a specific like topic other than just multi or just modeling and maybe biology related? So it seems like you're asking two things. One is about the topics, and one is about the timing. Is that yes. So the timing for our single investigator projects is yeah there's no um, there's no particular there's no deadline. Sometimes I actually make deadlines just so because people seem to be <laughs> seem to like deadlines. So I'll just make one up. Um, but we tend to get our money in at, like October November um, time frame. Um, so you know we'd want to get something in around now i would say by now or or soon thereafter if we wanted to be able to have a chance of having it funded with um uh 2022 funds 
um, but there are other programs like this, that rep program or depth score, um, you know, other programs have their own deadlines. S the SBIRs, STTRs, of course, are a whole, whole separate, um, separate program that have their own deadlines. Um, but the main, and then the MURIs are definitely have deadlines, but um, in terms of single investigator program, that, that, that it's a rolling, that's a rolling kind of thing. Um, in terms of the, of the, the subject matter, can you, can you ask your question again? Uh, I just was wondering if there was a specific scope that the proposal should focus on or, because I know that you mentioned during your presentation that um, if you think that you have, basically if you think you have something that would be useful to the DOD or something that could be um, some basic science to see if a white, first submit a white paper and see if it would be useful and then go from there. But I was wondering if there was more of a specific topic. And those those thrust areas that I said are the main are the main things that I'm looking for, but if you think you have a really good idea that doesn't really fit those, you know, feel free to email and we'll set up a you know set up a time to talk. I'm always willing to okay. listen to, to to ideas. Um, one thing I didn't say was that I do a lot of co-funding with. I mentioned other programs, but I do a lot of co-funding with with other programs at ARO. I could be doing it with other programs at ONR, AFOSR. Or even more broadly, but I don't you know, just haven't been doing that. Um, so if there is a lot of if there is work that's more you know experimental, <clears throat> um, typically I would be looking for a partner to to fund that because I don't my program just isn't set up to be um, paying for a lot of experimental work. <clears throat> so, but yeah, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that can that can work, and if you know if we have good people that are doing good things, then we try to we try to see if there's a way to make it work. Okay, thank you. I guess okay. along this, well, I have one more very quick question. So, so what, what's the, if you make it to the actual submission of a proposal, um, what's the success rate um, at that at that point? Because I think you, or can you estimate that? Like, is it, you said it was, it, you sort of funnel folks out, you funnel out um, proposals before you get to that actual submission stage. Is there a, yeah, Is that's it? a that's a that's a tricky question. Because <laughs> I have to say our another director that we had wanted to say that it was that the, that the rate was very low or to me it was low as like, you know, 30 something percent. And all of us were saying, no, it's more like 90 something percent because we don't want to get right. proposals that we don't think there's a good chance of funding. Right. So, um, you know, I'd like to, yeah, I mean, so I guess the caveat there is that you might have to wait a while. It doesn't mean that it's going to get funded that year because oftentimes right. we can only, you know, we have to wait for the right opportunity, but oftentimes money comes along that we weren't expecting. I guess at this point, because it often comes along, we should be expecting it. But, um, you know, if you have things, we have things that are ready to go and, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll get something for, I'll have my boss send an email saying, if you have a, a project, a new start that's ready to go right now, then, you know, our, his boss has money to fund it. And if I have something ready to go, then that's it. You know, we got it, we got it funded. So it's very, it's a very, um, um, it's, it's, it can be um, not a very, you know, not as formal maybe of a process as with some, with some organization. So, um, yeah, so I, I'd like to think that the, the rate is pretty high. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, more questions. Thomas, um, I was wondering, I know early on in the pandemic, there was an apparent decrease in, in r naught that was mirrored everywhere that they talked about it. The physicists all thought it's very interesting that it seems to be a universal curve. Well, whatever the social distancing and, and lockdown rules were, essentially because people were frightened and so they reduced their social context no matter what. How do you, how do you separate sort of social changes. Uh, I know you're looking very early in the epidemic, but maybe you're, there's less of that going on. But when you're doing your estimates, for example, for, for strain, uh, strain uh, uh, competition, how do you, how do you include uh, changes in, in policy? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. So uh, 
uh, when we calculate the reproduction number, you may notice that we took only two weeks and then the curve uh, flattens just because the social distancing. So, of course, this uh, reproduction number is no equal to the basic reproduction number. Basically, in average for last two years, the reproduction number is very close to one. So the epidemic is fluctuating. When we are calculating the advantage of uh, the new strain, the social distancing is completely not important because what we are uh, calculating, we are calculating in time the ratio of cases of one variant to the uh, uh, to the number of, of other variants. So it doesn't matter whether, say, uh, uh, total number of uh, registered cases is decreasing or is increasing. Only what matters is how behave the ratio of new variant to the old variant minus new variant. And it behaves in the exponential way if one variant has advantage over the other variant. Okay, thank you. Other questions for either of our speakers? I mean, I, 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 was, I was particularly interested in your talk, Thomas, because I'm teaching undergraduate math modeling course. And so we start out by doing SIR models and then we take the, of course, we take the worldometer data and fit it. That's what we do next week. Uh, one of the problems always with the SIR models is the recovery time. So you, the, a lot depends on the, your estimate of the, the, the duration of the infectious period, your recovery time uh, in, the, in the I to R. And, and if you look at worldometer, they'll give you uh, active cases. And if you fit that, then you get something that seems reasonable. But, but actually, the, 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 that active case number is synthetic. Uh, they assume that people recover after a certain amount of time, so they actually build in the recovery time. Uh, how, 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 do you, how do you deal with uh, estimates on the, on the recovery time? The, the, the infection rate is, is you expect to see in that early exponential phase. But how do you, how do you get an estimate of the duration of infectivity? For infected individuals, uh, um, people uh, by analyzing these uh, uh, single cases in which they know who infect whom, it was really tedious work. They know what is the serial number. So serial number is the time. Uh, uh, that I infect you and you infect somebody. So this is the average time uh, to passing it to the new generation. So it gives you the, uh, you said recovery time, but I would prefer to say removal time because it is not important how long you are ill. It is important how long you are infectious. And the time you are infectious is much shorter than the time you are ill. You can be ill for a month or, or several weeks, but you are infectious for a relatively short time, not even because you cannot infect anybody, but because you are self-isolating. So people notice that this infectious time is relatively short, is of order of three days. Yeah, so, so, so this is really important that, that you are not taking the, the length uh, of illness, which can in, in extreme cases can be longer than month. You can spend in bed in hospital, but you are 
taking the the effective time uh, in which you are infectious and it uh, uh, takes into account the social behaviors. Once you notice that you are ill, you are like, in, in general, you are stopping being infectious because you self-isolate. So then if you use the longer, the longer removal rate of three weeks, you'll underestimate the infectivity because the people, the, the infected individuals have too long to, to do the same amount of infection. Um, no, it is not. Uh, not so simple. This is not as simple as that because it, it, okay, it depends from uh, what variable you calculate the reproduction number. If you calculate the reproduction number from doubling time, yeah, then uh, if the serial uh, number will be higher, then you will get the smaller reproduction number. I can explain you like this. Okay, basically the serial number is of order of one week. Yeah, so the latent period is about five days and then this infectious period period is a three days, but you to, to get the serial number, you are taking the latent period plus half of the infectious period, because this is time from infection to infection. So it is about one week. So if you just assume that there is a very narrow distribution, you simply infect next person after one week, right? So if you will infect, uh, if you will infect, uh, uh, three persons after one week, it will mean that the number of infected people will grow threefold uh, in one week, all right? If you, uh, and now you can imagine that, oh, okay, uh, uh, say better, you are infecting, uh, you are infecting four persons after one week. So in one week, the number of infect, infected persons will grow fourfold. And now you can shorten, you can think that this uh, serial period is shorter. It is only half a week. So if it is half a week and you see that the number of infectious person grow four times in a week, then it means that it grows two times in half a week because it grows two times in half a week times two times in next half a week you are getting four times so it means that you are infecting only two people right so if you are calculating it from the growth the shorter is the serial uh, period the smaller is the reproduction number because you, you are making more rounds. You see? Okay, time for one last, one or two last questions. For, from our holdouts. I'll ask, I'll ask one more if nobody else has one. Go <laughs> um, ahead. Please. Sure, uh, Tomas. Um, so I, I mean, as I do a quick scan of Wikipedia, um, you know, your, your number would put the R naught at the level of, you know, above what's the estimated Delta variant R naught and close to measles. So, have you looked at other, have you looked at like the Ebola epidemic 
is there enough data there to sort of recalculate the R naught there and see if that's accurate? Um, I always thought that was a little bit low. Um, could you do this for other, is there enough data out there to do a similar analysis on other infectious agents or is SARS-2 a unique opportunity because of so much data? Uh, I, I would be very cautious to, to, to do it for epidemic like, like Ebola because the Ebola has a very high death rate. So the uh, protection effects, the, the, the distancing is, is, and, and all the protection measures they very strongly influence the reproduction number. So in a sense, pity with this SARS-CoV is that it has relatively small death rate. So we are close to doing nothing. If the death rate would be 10%, we will have no epidemic uh, because the protection measures would be so strong that we would not have epidemic. So the, it is like the maybe the 1% death rate, it, it, it is the, the worst possible death rate. So, so I, I think you, you may not do such analysis for the disease which have very high death rate. So as I understand, so you can't do an R0 for a high pathogenic death rate or is that uh, what you're getting you, at? You cannot do the analysis in which you assume that you, that over a given period, you have the constant exponential growth for epidemic with a very high death rate. Because it'll because burn itself out, okay. In, yeah. in such a case, people are protecting themselves very strongly. Fair enough, thanks. Okay, any other last comments? I have. I have a lot of things I'd like to discuss with Virginia, but probably it's better to have that in a separate phone call. Uh, it was a fascinating, really interesting to see your portfolio. I appreciate it very much that you showed us. Sorry for all the problems. <laughs> oh, well, I've been sitting here with Zoom problems myself. My Zoom client keeps disappearing, and then I can't, I can't mute, unmute, screen share, anything else. So I don't know what's causing that. So, so... Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. I appreciate Tomas, I know it's late there uh, and uh, really appreciate that. I hope you'll come back and also talk to us about some of your other projects because you've been worked on so many interesting uh, projects related to infectious disease and immune response. Uh, Virginia, thank you again. Thank you everybody for coming. And, I'll look, for and I'll look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week. With that, I'll call the meeting to a close for today.